Hello, friends. What's up? So this is actually a solo episode this week, and um, we're going to be talking about change and like cycles and seasonality and what it has to do with leadership. And um, we're going to be talking about it in some like probably some unconventional ways. And, you know, it's th this is all so perfect because for people who know me, um, they know I like to change. <laughs> they know I don't like it's not that I like to change. It's like if I see that change is going to be helpful in a scenario, I do it. Um, and, and one of the things that I've actually worked on in my life as a leader is to really learn, okay, when am I going after change in order to like, like avoid discomfort versus when am I kind of surrendering to change because it needs to happen. And there's been so many things that have changed, like so much of stuff, so much stuff in my life has changed in the last three years in particular. And also like the last six to eight months, you know, we moved, um, we sold our house of 11 years. Uh, my husband went back to really focusing on working at home, thinking about what his next steps are going to be. We switched school systems. Um, I really shifted the, the type of work that I'm doing. Um, we had team start really coming in and doing more work with us at the Institute, um, really creating more uh, defined roles and accountabilities for everybody. We had team members leave unexpectedly. Um, most recently, this week, this past week, uh, I ended up taking back over one of our foundational programs trips and uh, stepping back into the head instructor role for that after we had a conversation with team and it made more sense to uh, have Janae, who was going to be teaching, doing some other things, which we're really excited about. So that was another change. We dropped the price of trips by like 60%. <laughs> so we took it down from about five and a half grand to like $2,200. And um, that was really a from a place of alignment and trusting myself. And there's been a lot of changes. There's been a lot of like little changes too, schedule changes and and, oh, this is what we were going to do with money over here. And now we're doing this, or this is what we we're going to do um, physically over here. And now we're doing this so much change, so much pivoting. And for those of y'all who are new to listening to me or new to our spaces, uh, I, I, I like forget this too. <laughs> I created a planner, like I, I ran a planner company for several uh, years. And in fact, we're looking at bringing our, it was called the Write Planner, W-R-I-T-E, because it was a journal planner combo. And we're actually looking at bringing that back um, in the back half of this year because it's a really helpful tool and I still use it. And um, I used to run planning workshops. And one of the things that really was interesting to me as I started my own business, as I left being underneath or led by someone else in terms of my work. So, you know, left academia where I had a boss, left the bedside um, from a nurse practitioner perspective where I had a boss. I left all these places, you know, and really became my own boss, became the person um, leading myself. Uh, and then also uh, allowing myself to, um, really surrendered to letting my husband lead more because I was in like total boss babe, independent woman mode when I first left work and um, thought that I needed to make all the decisions for myself all the time and handle and have my hand in everything all the time and realize like that's definitely not a thing. Um, but I, I share that because when I first approached planning, I really thought, okay, well, you know, you, you create a plan to execute the plan. Like you create a plan so you can execute a plan. The point of the plan, the point of planning is to like do things as close to the plan as possible. And in a lot of professional settings, when you create a plan, that is the idea. The idea is, is that the plan gets you closer to a, an outcome. The plan gets you closer to a goal. And something I've realized is that that's a pretty, um, masculine, you know, to use a gendered term here, that that's, that's one way, that's a very structured, um, direct, firm way of thinking about planning. And there's this other piece to planning that, you know, from a gendered perspective, it's a little more feminine. 
it's a little more flowy, a little more um, uh, dynamic, a little more open to change, a lot more open to change. And that's really, okay, I'm going to sit down and think about how this could go and what the journey could look like on my way to this outcome. And by doing so, I'm going to understand what the the map, the journey looks like a little bit more, a little bit more clearly. I'm going to understand where maybe some pitfalls or some obstacles, some detours might happen. And I'm, I'm also going to like be able to ask myself, how do I want this journey to feel? How do I want this to go? And, and the nice part about that, if you can identify how you want a journey to feel, how you want to approach it, like what are the values that you'd like to embody along the journey? Um, at the end of the journey, when you get there, what do you want to be able to say about how you traveled? Who you traveled with, where you traveled, when you traveled, why you traveled. Those curiosities, those reflection points are such an important part of planning because the outcome is like a moment, right? The moment you hit 10K months, the moment you sign a new client, the moment you um, get a degree, like they hand you the degree, the moment that all of those outcomes happen, they're just moments. And they only exist really for that moment. And and this has been talked about time and time again in leadership books and psychology books and, and personal development all over the place. You know, people un- overestimate how reaching an outcome, how much satisfaction and like excitement, fulfillment, um, completion sense that that's going to bring them. People really overestimate how much that outcome moment, how strong it's going to feel. And they also overestimate how long it's going to last. Any of you ever had that where you're like, you're pushing so hard for a goal and then you get there and you're like, oh, that's cool. (laughs) What's next? And that's really how our brains work. That's how, that's how we work as humans. We are not static individuals. We reach goals and we reach peaks and then we decide that we want to try something new or try something different. And I hear this all the time in business. I hear this with clients. I hear this, you know, um, in spaces where I'm doing trauma coaching. I hear this, I hear this everywhere. I see this a lot of time in like TV shows. Oh, I can see it. So often we are putting so much focus on the outcome that we get the outcome and it doesn't feel the way we think it was going to feel. And the way we got to the outcome did not feel aligned or good. We did things that were outside of our morals and values. We did things that like pushed us in a direction or took us to a place that we didn't want to go. And even if you hit the outcome, you're not exactly stoked about the journey you took to get there. Like you feel out of integrity. Maybe you had to like cut some pieces or parts off of yourself or pretend to be somebody that you weren't or um, disconnect from somebody that you love or connect with somebody that you didn't want to connect with. Like you maybe you had to do some things in order to have the thing you wanted to have or to get to the place you wanted to go. And so, you know, this can sound a little depressing. (laughs) When we talk about planning, this can sound a little depressing. I honestly, for a while, I didn't do outcome goals. Like I didn't set goals around outcomes. I really just focused on the journey. I didn't have um, a monetary goal outcome for my business for a very long time because it was like, I have to fall back in love with the journey here. I can't keep saying, oh, well, when I hit 10K months, this will feel better. When I hit 20K months, this will feel better. When I hit 30K months, this will feel better. I had a 50K month, but it didn't feel better because the, this, the journey to how I was getting there, there were still some issues there. So, you know, my approach to change, number one, I'm an early adopter. If anyone's ever like seen the change scale where they like label you from one to five um, in terms of how quick you are to make a change versus how long you're going to take to make a change, I'm, I'm either the person making the change or I'm a pretty early adopter. Now, the caveat to that is, is I have to understand why we're making the change. If you tell me we're making a change and I don't get it, or I disagree with why we're doing it, I am not an early adopter. I will have a hard time getting on board with that. And if you can explain to me, like, like I'm, I'm legit curiously asking why, because I want to understand. Because once I understand, like, I will be a champion of the change that you want to make. 
but you got to like sell me on it. And then I'll go sell everybody else on it for you. I'll make your job really easy. <laughs> but I share that because I'm an early adopter, an innovator or an early adopter of change. Change feels pretty easy to me. And, you know, these last couple of weeks when um, we came out and I shared an email, like, look, I've noticed that the way that we've been journeying through this TRIPS launch through our trauma-informed psychologically safe certificate program launch, like it, it just really hasn't felt good. Um, and, and it's felt pretty good, but like there's been pieces and parts along the journey that haven't been quite right. And I couldn't figure out what was going on or why it felt so weird. And I figured it out. It's because the way we're charging, the way we're selling, the way we're setting this up, we're perpetuating systems of harm that the Institute was actually designed to pull down. And so, or not even pull down, but like just not participate in. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so noticing that I've kind of on this journey, gotten away from where I wanted to, how I wanted to journey. So cool. Let's shift that. So we sent out an email and then a couple days later, today and I had a conversation and it was the Wednesday before the Monday that trip started. So like four or five days beforehand. And it was like, okay, this isn't going to work. Um, we need to do some shifting. And so shifted it, felt my feelings, got grounded and regulated, centered, and then shared it to people who were already in the program and then shared it to people who were thinking about joining. And I got a couple reflections back from people that are like, wow, your willingness to both adapt your plan and also your willingness to like tell us the like how the sausage is being made in the back room and also um, your willingness to just own this and not feel shame or guilt around the fact that you're changing things again is like really cool. It's really, it's, it's, it's cool to watch you model that. And it reminds me that I can change. And there were a couple other like cycles of change going on underneath of this personally for me. So one is it's winter, it's Ohio, the weather's actually been kind of wonky, but it's been, you know, swinging 60 degrees in either direction. Today's 74. A couple of days ago, um, it was snowing and like unexpectedly, and it was super cold. You know, like that's a lot on someone's body. Plus it's about to be daylight savings time. That's a change and a shift from a body clock perspective. The other piece is, is that, um, you know, right around the time that we were having these conversations around trips, I was in like my pre-menstrual phase. So like I was six days away from my, uh, the day that my period was supposed to show up. I track that as a woman entrepreneur, business owner, just as a woman in general, it is so helpful to track that because, you know, our business, the professional businesses, the way that we run the world, it's actually built on the male hormonal cycle, the 24 hour cycle. It's built on the day cycle. And for women, um, those of us who are bleeding, like that is not the cycle we follow. Yeah, there's a 24 hour day for like our cortisol and for a lot of our, some of our hormones, but other hormones in our bodies follow a 21 to 35 day cycle, an average of 28 days. Um, there's also the seasonality happening in the world as well. So there's other cycles, there's other change um, uh, seasons that get to be considered in our planning if we're not just running business like men. And for the men out there who are listening, like, if you were never taught any of this, it's cool. I wasn't taught a lot of this from a, a cycle perspective until it's like a few years ago. And it was such a profound shift and actually teaching this to my husband and teaching this to my son and to my, um, my other two kiddos who have um, periods like that in our house, like the hand, the kids understand people understand that like, uh, six days before for me that day, that is when I am the most emotional. That is when I am the most tired. And then it gets a little better slash hang steady for the next five to six days. And then I start feeling a little less emotional. And then usually by like day three or four of my period, I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. I'm feeling better. My energy's back. I want to work out. I can lift heavy. Like yesterday I was in the gym, busting it out. 
And my male trainer was like, oh my gosh, like you're beasting it today. And I've shared this with my male trainer. I'm like, look, (laughs) you're going to get a different version of me depending on what week of the month it is. And not like first of the, like first week of the month, not March 1 through 7, but my month, my 28 day period. So like when we talk about planning, right? I'm having to have these really hard conversations while I'm also hormonally in one of the most challenging times. And so like being able to know, okay, hey, the overarching way that you want to journey in your life is like, look, if we need to make a change, we make a change. If we need to cancel a call, we cancel a call. If we need to shift something, we shift something. If we need to add something on, we add something on. I have stopped making myself wrong as a woman, as a mom, as an entrepreneur, as a wife, as a human for the fact that I have cycles. I have cycles. I have a cycle living in Ohio <laughs> where the winter is harder. I have a, I have my own hormonal cycle and our business has a cycle too. So at the Institute, we take off um, several weeks in, in the year and those include in July and in December. And the reason behind that is seasonally That makes a lot of sense. July is like the height of um, summer where we're playing and having fun. And like, you want to just be on break. And December is like around the solstice, the winter solstice. That's the darkest time of the year. We're tired. We're resting. We're preparing for um, the new year. That's also, you know, a spiritual time of the year for a lot of people. And so that's, those are cycles in our business. We have launch cycles in our business. And so the idea that, yes, we want to plan, we want to have structure, we want to have a firm idea of where where we want to go, why we want to go there, and how we want to go there. And we also get to really feel into like that journey piece of, okay, and each day, how do I want each day to feel? How do I want each decision that I make to feel? Like, what are the things that I want to ensure that when I lay my head on the pillow at the end of the day, this is what I at least feel. It doesn't mean that things went according to plan. It doesn't mean that unexpected things didn't pop up. It doesn't mean that I'm happy with the outcomes. It means that when I look at it, I'm like, did I, these are my values. Did I show up in integrity? Did I show up from a space of mutual benefit? Did I make sure that the decisions that I made um, honored my needs and other people's needs as best as possible. Uh, did they, were those decisions respectful, right? Were they, uh, um, coming from a place of attention to what was going on and intentionality around what was going on? Um, are, were they compassionate? Like, did I make them with love? Did I treat people as people, as humans, instead of looking at them as transactions? Did I treat myself like a human instead of looking at myself as like a productivity machine? And the last one for me is kind candor. Like, did I tell the truth and did I say it um, in a way that, yeah, it might be hard to hear in the moment and it's going to benefit us long term? So I wanted to share that because, you know, one of the most unprofessional things, one of the things that I was taught was the most unprofessional is like, you shouldn't cancel things. You should, you know, stick to your schedule, no matter what you should um, do the same things every day. Like y'all, if you're out there and there are you, if you're particularly a woman or you were socially conditioned or like raised as a woman, a lot of y'all, and, or if you have like female hormones, a lot of y'all were taught (laughs) A lot of you have have been conditioned by society to believe that since you have, um, just be that like, you may have those hormones or you may have that conditioning socially, and you're still supposed to operate in these ways over here that are like based on the 24 hour cycle. You're not supposed to take time off. You're not supposed to plan your business meetings around your periods. You're not supposed to. Um, you know, plan your launches or, or, uh, let your kids know what's going on with you when you have your highs and your lows. Like you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to just like keep it as even keel as possible. And, um, that's what we do professionally, right? We don't let people know when we're struggling. We don't let people know when we're having a rough, um, mental health or physical health day. Like we don't let people know when there's something else that's taking up our capacity. We don't let people know when we need to make a change in order to support ourselves. We, we don't come at things from that mutual benefit perspective. We either 
ask people to sacrifice their needs or we sacrifice our own in order to try to meet other people's needs. And it just doesn't work. So this idea of, um, I, I really like to think of planning from this perspective. What if the plan that you create and that you stick to is, what if this is your plan? I'm going to do my best to identify the outcome that I want to achieve and to map out a journey that feels good. And I'm going to give myself permission to at any point, like look up, look around, pause for a second and make sure that the plan that I am trying to stick to, that plan that I originally designed, that it still fits, that it still honors my needs and the needs of the other people involved. It still allows us to get where we want to go without burning out or overwhelming ourselves or hustling or striving or driving and like getting to the end and it and being like, this wasn't even worth it. Can I do that? Can the, the thing that I commit to be, can the discipline that I develop around this, can the firmness in the structure be, I'm allowed to evaluate this at any point. It doesn't mean I'm going to shift it. And in fact, I'm going to have clear guidelines for myself around when and how I shift it. And I'm allowed to shift it. Yesterday, during our first trips group call, I told the group, I said, look, we have these calls planned. Um, this program runs through December. Um, I've had five days to look at my schedule and like get, get these calls in what I think is the best place for us. So I have planned this out through August. And then by the end of May, I'll get you the calendar for the rest of the year. The reason behind that is it's my kid's school year. Our lease is up in August here. I am, and, and we're planning on renewing it and things change. So I said, hey, the plan is that we know our dates until August. And then in a couple of months, once we have a better idea, a better picture of what's going on, we'll add more to the plan. The other piece is, as I told them, I said, look, I ask myself before every call, if I have at least 80% capacity, and I know what 80% feels like for me, if I'm below 80%, I'm going to reschedule our call. And the reason behind that is you're paying me. You are paying me to show up and to deliver. You are paying me to show up at full capacity. And the idea that I'm going to show up when I'm 30% or 50% and like phone it in, that doesn't serve me and that doesn't serve you. I used to have to do this when I was a nurse and as a nurse practitioner, I remember one shift, nobody could cover me. And I knew I was like 95% sure that I didn't have anything contagious, but I worked in bone marrow transplant. Nobody could cover my shift. It was a 19 hour shift. And my office, my on-call room had a bed and a desk and a couch. And it was right next to a bathroom. And I had like a stomach virus. I think I had food poisoning. I was in that bathroom for like 14 hours of my shift. I was answering pages, like, like sitting on the floor or laying in the bed. No one should have to do that. No one should have to show up and work when they are 30 to 40% of their capacity because they have to. I can guarantee you that my patients didn't get the, like, they were all safe and they got, like, I worked with my colleagues to ensure that I kept my patients safe. I want to be very clear about that. In fact, um, I worked with another nurse practitioner who did the physical exams on my patients that night just to ensure that I wasn't coming into contact with them. And how often do we do that to ourselves, especially those of us who are our own bosses? How often do we push ourselves to work when we are like really tired? How often do we not allow ourselves a 15 minute break? How often are we taught? And if you think about this, going back to our school system, you got to get a bathroom pass and sometimes they don't even let you go. You have to ask to get a drink of water. You have to eat when they tell you to eat. You stand when they tell you to stand. They, you sit when they tell you to sit. You go outside for recess when they tell you to go outside for recess. They're training you. <laughs> They're training you to go, it doesn't matter what you need. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And that is helpful to a point. 
in a lot of careers. And also we've, we've as a society really started to create such strict boundaries and guidelines and plans and policies and procedures around how we do things to the point that it is starting to cause harm. It's starting to cause harm, right? Why did we not have a policy with a backup person on call? Why was it, yep, there's only one of you and if you can't work, like somebody else has to pick up 30 extra patients, it's not safe at all. So either come in sick or someone else is gonna be completely overloaded. Figure it out. These, this type of planning and this idea that we just push through this idea that it's unprofessional to change your mind or it's unprofessional to say no, it's unprofessional to set a boundary, it's unprofessional to even talk about these things. It's unprofessional to talk about the fact that you have a period, Lee. Okay, well, I'm allowed to talk about the fact that I have hands or that I have a nose <laughs> or that I have kids. I'm allowed to talk about the fact that I hurt my hip. I'm allowed to talk about the fact that I have a migraine. I'm allowed to talk about the fact that you know, I tweaked my knee running. I'm not allowed to talk about the fact that I have cramps. I'm not allowed to talk about the fact that I'm tired or emotional. I'm not allowed to talk about the fact that I feel dehydrated or bloated. Like why, why are these conversations not allowed to be happening? Why do I have to pretend that I'm okay when I'm not? Or why do I have to pretend that my capacity is different than it is? The whole idea of muscling through in order to hold someone else's standard. Do we want to keep doing that? That actually seems pretty unprofessional to me. That doesn't allow me to move in my zone of genius. That doesn't allow me to help people to the full extent because if I could take a couple of hours to take a nap or if I could postpone this call for a day or maybe we have next week off when we're supposed to meet today. So instead we have this week off when we meet next time. Like that's the helpful thing to do. And in case you doubt me, because right now this would be hard to do in our current system. So if you're like, Lee, I don't even know how to do this in our current system. Like we can talk about it. I'm happy to help you. And a lot of you are leaders. Like y'all are the ones who get to actually start modeling this for people. And you showing people this can have a profound impact on your organization. In fact, and I'll share this for you because a lot of y'all are like, no, I would get fired or this would happen. Or like people would just think I was the worst or, you know, people would think that I wasn't as hard of a worker or I didn't like really care. For those of you who are worried about that, I cannot tell you how many times when I've gone to cancel a call or I've gone to reschedule something that people are like, oh my gosh, thank you. I was actually really not feeling good. <laughs> or I had something else come up and like I was hoping we could reschedule today, but like I was just going to go ahead and do it because, you know, it was on my calendar and I didn't want to seem unreliable. And I'm like, do you want to know when I find people to be really reliable is when I trust that when they're there, they're there. When they show up, they're at full capacity or close to it. They're going to be able to be present with me. They're going to be able to pay attention. They're going to be able to be intentional. They're going to make good decisions. They're going to be more regulated from a nervous system perspective because they've asked themselves the question of, does it make sense to go through with this plan? And if not, they've asked for an accommodation or they've asked for a shift or they haven't even asked. This is what I do. I don't ask my clients anymore if I can cancel a call. And by the way, if you're like, oh my gosh, how often does this happen? Very rarely. It used to happen more when I would push through for a week and then I'd get super sick and then I'd have to cancel things from like multiple calls over multiple days. Instead of just going, you know what? I'm going to cancel this one call this one time and then this isn't going to affect anything else. But people will come to you and say, wow, thank you for modeling this. Thank you for showing me that this is okay. Thank you. And if they don't, if they don't, well, then that kind of shows you, hey, maybe this person really likes the idea of traditional planning. Maybe this person likes the traditional idea of like, I said I was going to do something, so I'm going to do it. Right? The I, it, With integrity, we always want to do what we say we're going to do. And one of my, our values at the Institute and one of the, the example statements of what we use when we talk about integrity is we say, we'll do what we do, what we say we're going to do to the best of our ability, 
and we honor our capacity at all times. So this is for a different episode entirely, but this really goes to boundaries. If you're having to change a lot of things unexpectedly, and this is a place that I've always had to remind myself, if you're having to change a lot of things unexpectedly or cancel or reschedule or do those things, are you saying yes to too much? Are you not honoring your own cycles? Are you not honoring your own seasonality? Are you not honoring your own plan and how you want the journey to feel? Because that's probably more of what's going on. You're saying yes when you want to say no and no when you want to say yes. And then you're having to move stuff around because it doesn't work. And then you do look unreliable or maybe you do look unprofessional. I have found that by honoring this from the start, honoring my capacity from the start, things are a lot different and I'm so much more reliable and I'm so much more professional because it's so much easier for me to do what I say I'm going to do. Also, because I've already let people know, Hey, if I'm not 80%, 70 to 80%, I'm not going to be there. And we'll do this when we're both good. And if you're not 70% or 80%, like, please don't show up. Cancel. My cancellation policies with my clients, they can message me two minutes beforehand and be like, hey, I'm really just not good. And I'm like, okay, great. Do you need like a 10 minute check-in to get better, to like get to full capacity? Or do you need to go rest? Do you need to go take care of a kid? Do you need to go do something else? And it's really that check-in of like, would the call be helpful for you to get back to full capacity or would the call drain your capacity further? Would us connecting be helpful or would it be harmful? And it's a great way for them to practice that intuitive huh, let me, let me think about it for a second. Yeah, no, this is what I need. If you are a leader, entrepreneur, business owner, parent, like y- y'all know at this point, I think already that I see everybody as a leader because you can lead yourself at the bare minimum. And you feel like your capacity is never 70%. Or like your capacity used to be, your your cup used to be the size of a, I don't know, um, a 64 ounce jug and now it's like a thimble, <laughs> then we've got something coming for you. And I'm not going to talk about it quite yet. I'm going to talk about it next episode. And if you've been looking for something in person, if you've been looking for something to help recharge your energy, your capacity to maybe put down some things that have felt really heavy or weighing on you that are also hindering your capacity. If you have been wanting to really like honor your own desire for change and your and start to plan in a different way, both in your personal life and in your life, you know, leading out in the in the world, whether it's in business or an organization or wherever, um, we've got something for you in November. It's coming. And <laughs> Um, I'm going to tease you a little bit and not tell you all about it quite yet. So I say all that to say, if you're listening to the podcast today, guess what? This wasn't a 10 minute episode. And this is one of the changes I decided to make. My solo episodes aren't going to be 10 minutes and I'm going to sprinkle these in every so often when I feel like it. And so if you like that, great. If not, and you just want to hang with the 10 minute episodes, that's cool. You can do that. And I missed this part after doing five episodes of the podcast. I was like, oh, I miss my solo episodes where I just talk and say the things. So I'm going to bring those back in. That's what we're going to do. And that's me being professional. That's me going, hey, I'm noticing that in order for me to continuing to, in order for me to continue wanting to do this podcast, in order for me to continue to continue to desire this, having the podcast to be an outcome that we see come to fruition over and over. The journey gets to feel really good for me. And what feels really good for me is not trying to limit a solo episode to 10 minutes on the podcast or trying to record a 90 minute YouTube show by myself. And it's also not having a guest every time because sometimes that doesn't work out because other people's lives change. (laughs) Other people have capacity things. So, um, you're welcome if that feels good for you. And if not, you can just skip these episodes and you can go listen to the other 10 minute ones with my guests. Okay. Either way, there's something here for you. And so, um, you get to make that choice, right? You get to now 
adapt your plan around listening to our podcast or watching the YouTube show. Like, okay, well now what do I want to do? This thing happened. Now what do I want to do next? And that gets to feel good for you. So I love you all. We'll see you next episode. Have a great rest of your day.